Hello. Hello and hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to run through the sort of context, first of all, of Oxford's uh, data management and what we're trying to put into place here. And um, this slide shows the sort of main areas that I will cover. And first of all, the drivers for actually um, doing this at Oxford you know, what, why are we doing it, basically? There have been some significant developments recently. First of all, um, the major funders, in particular the EPSRC, which is one of the research councils of the UK, um, has put out a new policy which is more stringent than the policies that have been out there before and are requiring institutions as much as researchers to take um to take a grasp of research data management and um it means that we have to put in place uh data curation for 10 years after the end of projects and some other um some other factors too now they've given us a bit of a lead in and we all had to submit um uh, a data management a roadmap by May last year, and they've given us till uh, May 2015 to put our other uh, services in place. So that has really, really focused minds, I would say, at the university, you know, in that we have to have this in place because um, the funding council is threatening to police um, what researchers do with their data. So, you know, it's focusing everybody's mind. Um, in addition to that, journals are increasingly asking for access and uh, citation of data sets. In many areas, there's a certain lack of systems and services for supporting this. And also, um, we, there's a sort of realization at the end of projects, when people get to the end, it's a sort of, ah, yes, well, I've got to the end of that now. What do I do with this data? and um, thinking that they, they need to do something with it, but they don't want to look after it themselves. So that also happens. So those have been the main reasons for actually sort of grasping this. And we have a very patchy picture at the university so far. Some departments and groups are very well served by internal um, storage systems and, and um, curating systems for their own data. Some are not sorted at all. Some have got external locations where they're almost expected to deposit their data, such as the UK Data Archive or the um, NERC Archive, which requests that data is deposited there as an output from the um, research project. Some just keep it on their personal computers. And some people, when we approach them about data, say, oh, I don't have any data. But then on further investigation, we find out that they've got images, you know, photographs, or some other sorts of things. So um, the, the term research data doesn't mean the same to everybody. Now, the role of the libraries, here we, we have plenty of libraries to go at. In this case, it's the Bodleian Libraries, which is providing a, um, a lot of the support services, or building them anyway. We've got a traditional archival role here for all sorts of research um, uh, sources and resources. And we are being contacted anyway by researchers asking what, whether they can deposit their research data with us. What we're trying to offer is not just bit storage. We're hoping to offer a sort of preservation service. I mean, this is still work in progress as to how exactly we do this, but that's, that is the aim. We're building our systems with a long-term digital preservation aim in mind. And we have a network of subject librarians who are out there in the academic community who can help and support people and point them in the right direction. And we like to think that we've got some metadata expertise here as well. Uh, this project, the Damero project, is a JISC-funded project that we're, um, that we're a part of. We've decided at the university that research data management is a multi-agency problem requiring a multi-agency solution. And so we've got this external funding. And we're aiming to address the whole infrastructure from policies through um, setting up systems and services, training and information that's required, and the long-term sustainability. So it's quite a big project. The library's role in the Damero project is that we're developing two central systems for 
to support research data management. And this builds on um, on the previous work at the at the university. And we've got um, a research data management website that um, has been set up and will be improved. And where we're sort of treating it as a one-stop shop that people can go to. Um, for information about research data. The two systems we're setting up, one is a data catalogue, which we're calling Data Finder, which um, is basically uh, for recording what data exists and also for discovery of research data sets. And the other is a data archive, which we're calling Data Bank for storage of data. Data Bank is a repository for Oxford data, not necessarily the repository. Basically, if somebody's got somewhere to deposit their data that's safe and secure and they're happy with it, well, fine, you know, we're happy for them to continue that. Our research infrastructure at Oxford is modeled around the research data lifestyle. There have been many, many implementations of this and, and diagrams and flowcharts and so on. We've taken one of those and have sort of layered our services, our developing services onto it. One other project that I should mention that's running parallel to our Damaro project is called Oxford DMP Online. And um, that's being run by Dr. David Shotton and he's setting up um, a data management plan tool for the university. So the idea is that we work in parallel and that the two things fit together. As well as that, fitting into the bigger picture of research publications, we're building a sort of suite of services, including the publications repository, <clears throat> um, for linking and citing between the two uh, services. We are having to look um, across a lot of different disciplines right across the university to make sure that our services fit for any of those different disciplines. Each has its own um, choice of metadata sometimes and also different types of content that they might put in. And to a lot of them, this idea of data management is very much a new idea. And so we're having to start right from the basics there. Um, that's sort of where we are at Oxford. So at this point, I will hand over to Wendy. Hi there, and everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, first, I want to give a real brief thanks uh, to OCLC for inviting me to do this. And I'm really excited to hear some of the things that come into the discussion at the end of this webinar. Um, but to look at what some of the drivers are for data curation on kind of this side of the pond, I think that one that's probably common to many libraries here um, is the directives that are coming down from those who are funding much of our scientific research, as Sally had mentioned. Um, two of the big ones here, obviously, are the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, and both of, they, both of them have requirements for at least some, if not all, of their proposals to include the written data management plan um, that tells how the project intends to manage and, when appropriate, how they're going to share their data. Um, I think that this topic of openly sharing research data is really in a state of growth and flux right now. Um, of course, the, many of you probably know about the Office of Science and Technology memorandum um, policy memorandum that came out earlier this year um, re requires any funding agency that has over $100 million in research and development um, distribution that they um, share a plan within the next six months or by the next six months of how they intend to encourage open sharing of data. Um, I think this is likely to lead to more changes and probably more requirements. Um, I think many of us working in data curation really assumed this was coming, but it's kind of exciting to have a time frame put on things. Um, and really not on this slide, but I can even mention along those, that same trajectory uh, last week's memo from the White House regarding um, with their statement of how they value information and the new requirement that's going to um, uh, mandate government agencies from this point forward to collect data in a way that's open and machine readable. And they even use the word um, extensible metadata in the actual memo, which was pretty exciting. Um, to me, this is all kind of a sign that we're moving in the direction of sharing and reuse, especially at a federal level. And while there are many drivers for actually having this happen um, 
to for the researchers themselves, there's a possibility that this will kind of have a trickle down effect, or at least that's kind of one of the hopes that I have. Um, so in addition to this kind of top-down um, requirements coming from the funding agencies, and as Sally mentioned, also from the publication agencies, um, based on several faculty surveys that we've done over the last few years, Cornell was aware of the fact that our researchers want services and they want help managing their data. Um, so knowing that and adding to it the um, NSF announcement of that data management plan requirement that goes along with the proposals, um, our Office of the Vice Provost for Research and the University Librarian joined to support the formation of the Research Data Management Service Group, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit today about some Cornell University library specific services that are related to um, data curation. Use of our institutional repository for research data, um, a registry for research data sets that we currently have in development, and some possibilities that we see for research data in our um, archival repository. So the RDMSG. Um, is a collaborative campus-wide organization, and I've pulled out some bullet points here from our mission statement that you can take your time and read, but um, the goal of this group is to provide support and education for a really a broad range of management needs for Cornell University researchers, for staff and for students. Um, one area of support is certainly DMP preparation and review. But our mission is really much broader than that. Um, our goal is to provide a single point of contact um, for finding services that are on campus, or if it's more appropriate to use services that are not Cornell-based, um, we point them in those directions. And we really want to do this at any point in the process, not just during proposal, but to help them implement that um, as well, all the way through to sharing and access at the end of the, the whole scenario. Um, I mentioned before that we know that there is a need for uh, data services and management help across the whole campus. This figure shows the distribution of the help requests that we have had within the RDMSG or coming into the RDMSG since January of 2011. And as you can see, we're not serving just one or two main domains here. Um, well, I guess you might say that. There's a, we're kind of heavy on the engineering end so far. But um, really what we've learned through this is that all of these subject areas have very different and very um, broad-ranging needs. Say someone in engineering or physics or genetics might come to us um, looking for help with how to best store and access some really large data sets. Um, a social scientist could come to us and say, hey, I'm really having trouble with figuring out this metadata standard. It's uh, surprisingly difficult to understand. Or say someone in like um, natural resources might want help finding or in, and or implementing tools to help them organize information within her lab group. Um, and to be able to provide this kind of help in the best way possible, we've really made data management support a priority across the entire campus, and the libraries are taking um, a very active role in providing that support. Wendy, um, we have a question in the chat room asking what level of staffing do you have for your research data management service group? Well, the library does provide, um, we have a group of consultants. We have a, a manager's council and a faculty advisory board, but the kind of on the ground, day-to-day um, -day people are a group of about a dozen consultants, um, over half of which are from the library, and they're people who are either have specifically written into their job descriptions research data management or support, or some are just interested and are managing to fit it into their jobs. And there's, like I said, a real broad range of expertise in these domains that are listed here as well as um, you know, intellectual property and um, uh, IT security and things like that as well. And I think that with that, I go back to um, Sally. Ah, yes, right. On to the next slide. All right, so, so, um, We'll be having a look at um, what we've done so far. 
and where we're heading, um, we're trying to pull in all these different aspects of research data management here. Um, it, I should sort of give a bit of a health warning here that what we're doing is all sort of theory at the moment. We're beginning to set up, but we haven't really done it in, in anger yet. So we're trying to build our systems um, to get going on this. Um, as far as uh, policies goes, we now have a university policy for research data management, which comes from the sort of right from the top down, as it were, although it's, um, it's difficult because of the collegiate nature of the university to get anything from that top level. However, we have got a sort of aspirational policy there at the moment. It's difficult to have a policy when you haven't got the systems and services there in order to support it. So at the moment, it, it is pretty top level. That's available on the um, university's research data management website there if you want to go and read it. Um, at a technical level, as I said before, we're setting up some of the systems there and I'll be looking at some of the metadata uh, fields and things that we're, we're setting up here in a moment when we go over to the demo. We have got um, somebody assigned to create a nice user interface, which will hopefully not be too scary for some of our users coming in and either depositing um, records about their data or for people coming in wanting to find out what we've got at Oxford. So you'll see um, a demonstration of that shortly. The legal aspect of data management provision is, is quite a tricky one, and um, one of the problems we're grappling with at the moment is who actually owns the data, which seems to be exercising quite a few minds, because that sort of governs what, what you can then do with it and, and the, the licenses and so on that goes on to it. So I'm still in contact with our legal services to try and sort out the um, deposit statements things like um, terms and conditions that we might put on our services. So that actually is proving quite a long and um, uh, challenging uh, process for us. We have got um, subject librarians beginning to get um, set up for providing information and training. However, at the moment, um, as many of you may be aware, the open access activities in the UK are really motoring and subject librarians at the moment are completely focused on trying to learn things like the difference between green and gold for uh, publications repositories. So for data training, that's a little bit further down the, the line at the moment. However, we are beginning to offer training um, within the academic divisions and that's being done partly by the Damaro project with colleagues in IT services and some um, set up from subject librarians and members of the libraries. The cost model and sustainability, um, I'm sure lots of you will have things to say about this later on. Uh, we're still working on it. Work in progress. This is really quite a tricky one um, as to who funds the services that we are providing or beginning to build. How do we keep this going in the long term? Some funding can be found from from the uh, research projects, but there are a huge amount of researchers at Oxford who do not participate in funded research and who is going to pay for their research data storage and so on. Another matter which has cropped up is if the um, policy applies to doctoral students, they're certainly not going to have, have funds to pay more often than not for data storage, so how do we deal with them? That's, uh, there's a lot of questions around that. So um, the time scale of what we're uh, preparing, the Damaro project is, uh, will end in mid-June, and at that point we hope to have our data catalogue pretty well up and running, although staffing of it is still something of a question mark hanging over it. Data Bank will be of a certain um, development, uh, point, but that will still need an awful lot of work on it to make it a full-blown service. And again, um, coming back to the cost model and sustainability, it needs some work there. So going on thinking about the metadata that we're using to describe our data sets, I mean, this is a bit sort of um, a basic what I've put up here. These are 
a list of fields that we feel should be mandatory for Oxford users for describing their their data set. Now, this has to be taken in context because we can only impose this on people who are manually depositing their metadata into our research data catalog. If we are harvesting from existing uh, locations, such as the UK Data Archive, which actually, having said that, they probably have wonderful metadata, but some of the other locations where we might harvest uh, some metadata from, we can't guarantee that they will have these um, fields uh, complete. So we're having to have a bit of a two-tier system. Any harvested metadata that comes in really needs to comply with the data site minimum. And um, anything that's manual, we can impose um, mandatory fields upon those, those depositors. We're trying to make it not too daunting for our depositors and to make our web form not too long. We don't want to put them off. The way we're going to be doing it is that there will be um, expandable fields that can be opened up to add more metadata. But if we get this minimum that we've got here, you know, we'll be a little way towards getting something that makes the data set citable and for us to know what we've got. We're using features such as um, autocomplete or type ahead so that you know it makes it a lot easier for depositors to be able to fill in the fields. And we're using controlled vocabularies wherever we possibly can. Now, because we're trying to create a, a suite of services, the Data Finder catalog the uh, Institutional Repository for Publications and the Data Bank for Data Sets. We're trying to make things common across those three services. So the controlled vocabularies will be common wherever we can, we can manage. We've been working on funder information over the last few weeks. Um, we have got a, a schema for funders. We've got three sources of funder information. One is a, a local list from our research services. We have been looking at the REOX list, which is out there, R-I-O-X-X. And we've also got names of funders existing in our institutional repository where people have assigned a funder and grant number to their publication. So those are all being munged together at the moment. And using that, I hope we'll cover a lot of bases for when people are trying to type in the name of their funder. Sally, were there, did you do user surveys to assess the types of data being generated? Um, that was one of the questions that came in. Um, user services, uh, sorry. Uh, user surveys. Uh, User said there was quite a lot of work done prior to this particular um, project on data in the humanities and some science data, but no, not as part of this project. I mean, basically, we're just assuming we can get pretty well anything, and um, the metadata, you know, we can cope with anything that's thrown at us, really. Um, we can also take subject-specific metadata, which can be um, deposited as a glob, an XML sort of blob if people are using DDI or something like that. I hope that answers the question, sort of. Um, but uh, we, we are expecting anything and everything, I think, is probably the answer to that question. And going back to two projects, one which was EIDCSR, which I can't remember what it, it stands for, which they did some work with um, data deposits, and Tsudami, which was about data in the humanities. I suppose the, the glaring missing area is social sciences in all of that. Um, as far as going back to controlled vocabularies, we're going to be using central information about people and affiliation. And I don't know if this is the best solution, but we've decided to use the, the um, Library of Congress FAST subject headings for subject headings, and we'll be using um, text keywords as well. Um, projects, we are hoping to be pulling in project information from DMP Online, ultimately, where a stub record can be um, created with minimal data about the uh, data that's expected for that uh, project, but that's a little way down the line yet. And we're hoping to identify people when they log into Data Finder that they um, 
they get a message saying, you know, are, is this yours or are, are you um, one of the creators of this data? And it will help them to complete some of the fields automatically. We can take uh, holding some of the controlled lists and other vocab vocabularies in um, a little website called vocab.ox.ac.uk where we're trying to keep them all together so they can be reused. And um, one of the fields which is mandatory is the location of the metadata, which could be a URL for digital metadata uh, for digital data sets, or it might be um, something like a person's contact details uh, if it's sort of glass slides held in a box at the back of somebody's office. Maybe and, you uh, should go ahead and do the demonstration now, Sally. Okay. Yeah, I can do yeah. that. Okay. So, well, hang on. Where do I click here? Somebody tell me where to click because I've completely lost it. Um, up at the top of your screen, there's a share um, menu, pull down menu, and you'll just click on desktop. Yeah. Well, I have completely lost the share menu. Sorry. It should be right above those tabs. The share? I can't see share at the minute, I'm afraid. I'm struggling with this. Uh, what I can do is I can, I've got some screenshots here. I can just do that for now because I can't see the share. It's at the very top, Sally, at the top of your screen. Okay, got it. Okay, can you see my desktop now? Yes. Aha, excellent. Okay, so this is Data Finder, and I should stress it is very much in its early stages, so it's, um, there's a lot of work to do yet on it. It's got a simple search here where you can search for keywords and so on. I won't demonstrate that because what we've got in it is not uh, demonstrable really at the moment. But for anybody wanting to come into Data Finder and contribute a record manually, they would go here. Now, I have, I've already logged in here, but the person would be prompted for their single sign-on at this point. And it's, at the moment, a rather horrible long list of fields. This will be compacted, rather, as I mentioned earlier, and will be um, uh, expandable fields and so on. And if they're the Oxford uh, depositor, they will be prompted for that, and hopefully that will fill in some of the information already. Um, just one demonstration of the... Um, of the uh, type ahead, for example, if I go in here and type in Cardi, um, if I get this far, <coughs> I could uh, select, for example, Cardiology. This is using the FAST subject headings, and for example, if I choose this option, it will come up with a nice subject area. Um, the person can also type in their keywords there. It's rather long we're going to retitle the um the headings for each box to make them a little bit more user friendly they look rather librarian-y at the moment so we're trying to make them a little bit more like a questionnaire and that should be going in in the next few weeks i hope and um we hope that people will find it pretty easy to add the details here, um, about your data, people will be able to select digital, uh, digital format or non-digital format. Slightly different um, fields for each of those. And down here, we've got information about is your data an output of funded research. If the, they answer yes to this, this will be a mandatory question, they will then have to um, input details of the funding agency and grant number, which um, will help us with some of the, the policy requirements of the funding agencies which are beginning to come out there. Um, while I'm here, I'll just oops, take a little 
excursion out to the university's research data management website, which is here. Um, again, this is in a formative uh, um, state, but this is our one-stop shop for research data management, and this is where people can get access to the university policy on research data management if they want to. And also here, we've got vocab.ox, which is where all our vocabularies will be stored and made available wherever possible. We've had a little look at Data Finder. Um, we can also have a look at Data Bank, which I have got here somewhere. This is Data Bank, which is in a rather less pretty state than Data Finder. Um, as you can see here, it's not, not beautiful, but we have got 12 data sets in here already. Interestingly, we set this up in about early 2009 as part of another data share project, another JISC funded project. And it was sort of prompted by a student, uh, Austin Brown, who had a, a digital appendix to his thesis and wanted to put it somewhere. So you can see on this list here that his uh, data package is openly accessible. And if we go in there, this is the data for his thesis. Uh, various versions available. You can make the back versions available if you want to. As I said, it ain't pretty. And we've got the metadata in there with the data packages. Thank you, Sally. I think at this point we want to start with Wendy so we have time for a discussion at the end. Yep, absolutely. Well, um, Oops, there we go. You'll need to click over the um, the screenshots that I popped in there. Oh, okay. Um, Indeed. So I thought I would start with um, talking a little bit about uh, Cornell's provisions for managing research data. Talk with a service that we actually um, ha currently offer for data curation. Um, eCommons is our DSpace-based institutional repository. Um, the goal of eCommons is to provide long-term access to intellectual content, or sorry, intellectual output um, in a digital form for Cornell faculty, researchers, staff, and students. Um, much of the content that's currently in eCommons is publications and manuscripts, but eCommons can and does hold data sets. Um, as well. By default, the content that is deposited in eCommons is openly available on the web. Um, depositors can request an embargo um, or a delay on that open access, but typically we really use that for thesis and dissertations. The goal here is to have this be um, an open access location. Um, there are some size limitations for the content. Um, Files should generally be no larger than a gigabyte, and a collection, a project worth of data should be um, not, shouldn't exceed 10 gigabytes annually. Now, I say those kind of loosely. Those, those size limits are really kind of grounded in the idea of sustainability, but um, to bring in that word reality <laughs> to this, thus far we really haven't had anyone push those or ask us to push those um, exceptionally far. Um, most data sets that are currently in the commons come nowhere close to those sizes. Um, and it'll be interesting to see as um, requirements for those DMPs are coming to fruition at the close of grants, um, whether we see an increase in data deposit in the institutional repository. Um, as we move forward with eCommons, um, there are some things that are on our radar, radar, really kind of on my radar at least, um, which hopefully I can communicate these forward that really specifically relate to data. And I think that um, one thing that we should think about or we can think about is evaluating what type of identifiers um, we should be assigning. Um, should we continue to use our current system of handles? Um, that we have any commons, or should we be using something a little bit more global, like a data set DOI for, or a data site DOI for our data sets? Um, our current version of DSpace doesn't um, 
support versioning and really our data deposit policy isn't supporting um, isn't in support of versions of content being um, deposited but this is something that's um, quite common in um, research data is to have updates and um, expansions on a certain data site and maybe we need to evaluate whether we want to offer that as part of this service um, it would it be possible for us to use or harvest some of the metadata that goes into eCommons to provide a really easy and obvious um, recommended citation for a data set that's in um, our repository? That's something I would really like to see to kind of move that idea of sharing and reuse and retribution really um, forward. Um, and speaking of metadata, um, the are we really collecting metadata in eCommons that is adequate for reuse? Um, and I guess one question I think we really should talk about is, is metadata for reuse the goal? Um, is it really just to, to have enough metadata to be able to have the people find the data um, and discover it? So here are listed the current elements that we use from Dublin Core with the qualifier, number of qual optional qualifiers in parentheses um, that are collected on all the data going into eCommons and I think one thing that we can talk about as we move forward is whether or not we really should be doing something uh, more along the lines of a um, data site schema as Sally had mentioned um, that might be more standardized. Um, that kind of conversation is ongoing and will continue um, as we move forward. Um, then moving on to a, a data service that we have currently under development. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit about our data set registry, which we are calling Data Star. Now, some of you might remember that we there was a first version of Data Star, which was really more of a, a semantic approach to metadata management. Um, that ontology-driven approach really still applies to the redesign of Data Star, but the focus is now on a data set registry. Um, with the goal being discovery and reuse of data sets um, throughout uh, the life research life cycle. This has been a collaborative effort between Cornell University and Washington University in St. Louis. And we've used information that we gathered in um, data there are data curation profiles of Cornell and WashU researchers. And we've used other profiles that are posted online from other institutions to guide the development of DataStar. Um, the URL for the project site is shown here, and the underlying ontology for Datastar is shared on SourceForge if anyone is interested. Um, Datastar is currently being developed to be used either as a, an independent application um, or ultimately and personally, I think even ideally, uh, to be used in conjunction with an institutional Vivo instance in order to be able to represent those relationships between researchers, their grants, their publications, and um, pull that into representing the relationship with their data sets as well. Um, as I said, Datastar is currently in development, but I can show you a little bit around our um, test site. So, this is the test site. Um, when you first, I've already logged myself into the test site. Um, if you are not logged in, you can still search the data. Um, you need to be logged in to be able to add a new data set. So those are the two main things people are going to do when they come here. Cer look for data or add new data. So I want to start with showing you how you would go ahead and look for a data set. Um, right now these are all test data sets in here, but I let's just say I want to find um, data on the common loon. So if I type in loons to the search box, I get anything that's currently in data in our registry that has to do with loons. Um, you can see that there are things other than um, data here. So if I want to simplify the results that are shown, I can click on um, research and kind of fast it down. Um, really, I want to what I'm looking for is a data set that has to do with loons, um, and I can drill down to find something that might or may not be of interest to me. If I click on the data set that um, I find of interest, the first thing you really get is um, some information about how um, the data set has been used and what other information or related data sets are available in or are registered in Data uh, Star. Um, that's right up front. 
And of course, as I said, this is a registry. It's not holding the data itself. So front and center here, and I think design-wise, this is going to be made to be even more, or I hope it would be made to be even more front and center, are links to the data itself. In this case, this data is found both in um, eCommons and KNB. You can click on that link. It will take you out to the KNB site um, where the data is actually found. Um, similarly, you could do that with um, a metadata, a standardized metadata um, link if, it, if the person has entered that information about their data set. So we can expand down here. I'm going to go ahead and expand all these to show you some of the other information similar, to, <laughs> Sally, to your um, data finder. We probably have a little bit too much information for most users here. Um, the minimal set is, the minimum requirements are pretty simple. but. If filled out, the person searching for data can get a really nice description of the data set, information about the authors, um, subject areas. Those subject areas, there's a number of different vocabularies that those subject areas can be pulled from, and the user has to choose which ones they're choose and assign which they're pulling from. Um, you can get information about the repositories themselves that hold the data. Um, and if, assuming the information has been entered, um, if I went to KNB, I would see information about KNB. Oh, of course, I chose the wrong ones. Choose information about, I didn't have any information entered about KNB. E-Commons, information about it could be there. Well, I thought there was going to be, and it would show, um, here we go, it would show other data sets that are found in that particular repository as well. Wendy, uh, is DataStar still a staging repository for storing working with data in process? It is not. We've, we've moved beyond that phase of the project and are now focusing on the data registry. So the data staging repository um, is being phased out. We can, however, speaking of the word stage, um, the research or the depositor can describe what stage the data is in. Um, really more to be um, helpful in the aspect of reuse, whether or not this is a finalized data set, whether it's something that's going to be added to annually, whether it's something that's really in the preliminary stages but someone wanted for some reason to register that data set anyway. Version information is not automatically gleaned um, when you deposit, but the depositor can put information about versioning in. Um, that's something that we've talked about um, adding to future versions is something is automatically assigning version numbers. Of course, things like keywords and um, temporal and geographic coverage information is really important to discovery, so that is all in here as well. Um, we're really working again on these linkages and relationships, and some of that is captured here in these areas of whether or not a data set is a part of something larger or a product of something smaller, um, and to kind of start to build those relationships here. Um, there's an opportunity to link in information from um, uh, documents and uh, other derived data sets. <laughs> um, and of course, down at the bottom here, um, you can put in information about um, identifiers, we have gone through the first step of testing for DataStar, and a lot of the design of this is really going to change. Obviously, presenting the depositor with all this information of different identifiers to put in kind of makes it feel like you have to have them all, and really that's not the um, purpose here. So there's going to be a lot of design changes as this moves forward. Um, so really briefly, if you were to go to um, add a new data set instead of looking for data that's registered in data set, um, a depositor would go, go simply go here, enter some core information marked with an asterisk, and then once the data set is added, they have the opportunity to fill out the rest of um, that metadata. Um, and we're looking, of course, at streamlining and deciding how much of that is really necessary, how much, how much of it will be used, and of course that um, user friendliness, as Sally had mentioned, is, is really key on our um, continuing development. Um, we've actually moved forward since this test site that I have access to, and there's actually a development site as well, so I'm going to go back to the presentation um, here and show you a couple screen or a screenshot of 
Oh, well, dear. I, Sorry. I, uh, screenshot. I went the wrong way. Screenshot of the development site where we've added um, facets along the left-hand side that's a little, that are a little bit easier to use. And again, similar to what I'd mentioned in eCommons, I would love to see on Datastar um, a build, the building of a recommended citation front and center. If this is for sharing and discovery, make sure that we have, give the people a really easy way to cite the data that they found, to appropriately cite the data that they found. Um, so there's a lot of exciting work going on here, um, and um, that will move forward over the coming years. Our key developer is out on maternity leave right now, so things are a little bit at a standstill, but we will get going on this again. Um, finally, I'd, in the last minute or so here, I want to talk about kind of where Cornell is looking for the future of data curation, and one thing that we have in the works is um, our library archival repository, um, and it might, this might serve as another option for data storage. In particular, we're looking at really large data storage here, and uh, keywords I think really are storage and, and preservation. Um, it's a Fedora-based system. It's meant to deserve, preserve um, our digital assets over the long term. And like I said, um, I think preservation is really a key word to it. I think that that concept is what drives both Coolar's strengths and our weaknesses when it comes to the possibility of storage of research data. Um, it really offers some true preservation services um, with redundant geographically isolated copies, checksums, etc. cetera. Um, but the, um, and it's intended to have very few size restrictions ultimately. Um, we'll see if the cost model continues to support that. But it's being developed as a dark archive, and as one might expect with a dark archive, there's really no discovery layer. Um, there's no plan for a delivery platform, um, and those are some key things that if we are trying to promote discovery and access of research data, that's gonna, there's going to have to be a change in the trajectory here. So as I said, this too is under development. Um, we're currently only accepting library materials for our content. And it's being funded by the library, so there's no direct cost to CUL depositors for it. But if we're starting to see, if we start to see a need, and if the decision is made at some point down the road that there is a need for something other than our current IR structure to support or to house research data, I think that Coolar, the development trajectory of Coolar, could be altered. We could decide whether there needs to be a different business model, um, and I think it really holds a lot of promise for data curation at Cornell as we move forward, particularly, like I said, of those large data sets. So that gives you a bit of an idea of what um, Cornell has going on at the moment. Right. Well, we're actually almost out of time, but I wanted to go to the issues that you and um, Sally have identified and see if any of the participants, you know, can chime in on their experiences. Could you move to the next slide right? So what about the metadata um, requirements? Um, are you, we already have a question, I mean, are you encouraging scholars to get scholars' IDs like ORCID? There was, didn't seem to be any place in either of your schemas uh, yeah. for metadata, for identifiers oh, sorry. of scholars. It's Sally here. Um, yes, uh, what you saw was the sort of first version of our, our fields. We've actually got, um, in the final version, we'll have a place for people to put their ORCIDs in. We're looking at institutional uh, membership of ORCID um, and all the other initiatives that there are. So, yes, that is going in. What about any other issues or any of the participants, if you want to unmute your phones, about metadata requirements? Wendy, what about at Cornell? Are you getting ORCIDs or other kind of scholar IDs? Uh, the conversation about ORCID ha ORCIDs has opened up here in particular. You know, I think it initiated from um, the work coming out of archive, and that is under discussion. At the moment, it isn't in Datastar, but um, I see it as a, a very likely um, addition to a future version of Datastar. Um, the metadata thing is a tricky one, you know, there's particularly if we, you're bringing in a combination of sustainability 
um, and the amount of work that it takes to enter proper metadata, you know, if the researcher is going to be responsible for that and whether it's, not, whether it's going to be clean enough to use as well or, you know, balanced with the possibility of harvested metadata and or um, curated metadata, those are all things that we're toying with when we try to figure out what, how much and what to include, and I'm sure Sally's group is doing the same. Mm. How, can I ask you a question, Wendy? Um, are you having a sort of review process for the metadata that's coming in? You're having a member of staff there to look at the metadata. <laughs> um, I, as a metadata librarian, would love to see that. Um, in reality, um, there, there's nothing in place for it. Um, I think that I think that there's going to be a need. I think that that will be addressed once we start seeing what kind of usage um, and what kind of calls for help we're getting when people start using this. Um, the first round of testing that we did, people were confused about what to put where, so we're very aware that we need to do things like enter help boxes and little prompts over things to explain what people need in hopes that we will minimize how much editing has to be done by a librarian after the fact. One of the questions that came in is, do the libraries have any involvement in encouraging best practices for data apparatus like code books, data dictionaries, et cetera? Um, I can answer that real quickly for Cornell. Um, we have, I actually have in development, or almost ready to go up on our website, the RDMSG website has a uh, web page with uh, information like that on it. Um, and I, I'm hoping to put up a document about um, best practices in general for metadata that is appropriate for actual reuse of data, something as casual as a README file for those that don't want to get into a standardized metadata schema. Um, the RDMSG is available to help with that kind of thing, um, and we hope to be able to promote it using our, we will be promoting it using our website for best practices, yes. And from our perspective, not as such, but because it's a multi-agency approach here, um, we've got people such as the ethics people, which is, I know it's not the question, but um, other agencies involved across the university. And um, I think this all needs to sort of feed into the training that will have to be sort of taken from various different angles for people and what they should be doing in the different disciplines. And do any of the participants want to speak up about metadata requirements? Um, yeah. Well, we're already at the end, um, but do you want to, of the two remaining issues, is there something you want to make sure uh, we hear about, whether it's on cost models or encouraging contributors, uh, encouraging faculty to contribute? Wendy or Sally? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I guess the other thing that really has been interesting at Cornell is that idea of how we get, um, you know, buy-in from the researchers. And I think a, a key to the success of it is really what we've found is a lot of people come to us and say, hey, we didn't even know that we could put our data in eCommons. So a lot of it really is going to be, I think, outreach efforts in combination with um, the mandates that are coming down, like that Sally and I had talked about earlier. Um, but a lot of it is just going to be education and, and having people know that these are possibilities for what they can do with their data. And that's um, really a key effort of RDMSG as a whole across campus. Yeah, I would like to, to sort of uh, second that, really. It comes down to training, and particularly with the early career researchers. Um, just getting them into the idea that they might actually need to describe their data and put it somewhere safe and think about it early on, um, I think that's that will help encourage them to participate. Um, but it, it is going to be an interesting uh, ride, I think, to see how how people do approach this um, in different ways. Ricky, if there's some questions that came in through the tweet stream or questions in the chat room we haven't addressed, Maybe we can address them after the webinar. I know people have asked for links to um, Sally's vocabularies and a couple of other things. Yeah, I think there's a number of links we can share. Um, one of the outstanding questions was about FTEs rather than just staff involved. It seems like most people working and supporting data management are, you know, added add-ons to their normal job. Does anybody have a sense of how many actual full-time equivalents are, it takes to run a, a data support? 
Um, I can say, I can get, I guess I didn't give FTE time when I answered that question. Um, uh, as far as my job is concerned, it's, it's really hard to quantify. In my job description, half of my time, up to half of my time can be ded dedicated to work as coordinator of the RDMSG, but I'm also a metadata librarian. Um, so if a quarter of my time is a metadata librarian, but I happen to be helping people with their science data, I'm also fulfilling both of those roles. So um, really it's key to my job description. There is at least one other person here on campus, um, Gail Steinhardt, who has it in her job description. And we're really fortunate that we have a love of data by other librarians um, that spend a fair bit of their time, although right now I don't think it's, it's quantified um, in support of data management. I think that that's something we'll have to evaluate more formally as we move forward. Yeah, same here. I mean, we haven't really um, decided what we need. I suppose it's sort of horses for courses, and we don't know what we need until we've got the sort of flow of data coming in. But we're going to try and um, dovetail any data services from the library's perspective, this is, into the other publications repository services as well, things like help desk and um, reviewing and so on. But as far as all the other um, time that would be spent by others, that's an unknown quantity yet. I think I should also add a little apology to OCLC about um, saying that FAST came from Library of Congress. I should correct that. It came from OCLC, so sorry about that. <laughs> well, it's based on LC subject heading. <laughs> All right, Melissa, I think we'd better wrap up since we're well over after the hour. Okay, well, thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you to the presenters, and thank you for um, your, your questions and your interest in this webinar. I will um, email all of you as soon as the recording and the slides are available so you can share those with others. And um, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you again. Thank you all.